Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes is produced by NJ Advanced Media. Subscribe and listen to the show at nj.com slash podcast. Join the conversation on Twitter by using hashtag Rebuilding Rutgers. Welcome to Episode 8, the season finale of Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes. I'm Joe Gillia. For the past few weeks, you've heard about the attempts to create a new culture at Rutgers and turn the football program around. But will it actually happen? Can it actually happen? We have a roundtable discussion on the future of Rutgers football under Chris Ash. Let's welcome in Ryan Dunleavy and Keith Sarger. They cover Rutgers for NJ Advanced Media. Steve Politi, our longtime columnist, and Todd Eric Hunt, our recruiting expert. Steve, we'll start with you. Rutgers obviously has had a tough year on the field, trying to lay a foundation off the field. How would you assess the first year under head coach Chris Ash? Well, I thought he got to a very good start. When he came in, he had to establish things. He had to get a good recruiting class going. He, he had some success in New Jersey recruiting I didn't think he would have. Uh, as far as the season itself, it's, it's really hard to, to see it as anything other than uh, below average. I, th- I thought they would be better on the field. I thought they would perform better. I, I thought they had more talent uh, than certainly the record shows uh, this season. Uh, so I'm a little disappointed there. I mean, clearly this is going to be a much bigger rebuilding job than I thought. So overall, I'm going to give him a C. You know, I mean, it, I, I had a high, exp- I had low expectations for the season. And I think some, you know, the, the team has even gone under that bar for me. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, some of the games, I mean, they were outscored, what, 224 to right. nothing in yeah. those big four games against the big teams in the Big Ten. And it got really ugly at times. And now they're going to try to move forward and be better in the future. Keith, for you, when you look at Chris Ash, and, and you've been around some different coaches here with Rutgers covering this program for a while, how would you evaluate his first year with the lows, the highs, everything in between? You, you talked about it right up at, at the top. You, you said changing the culture, and I think that's a big part of it that gets lost. And we've written so many stories about the culture change and how when he, what he inherited goes beyond the, 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 the recruiting, and we've discussed you know, at, at length that – he essentially lost two recruiting classes between 2013 and 14. Uh, 40% of those players are no longer there. So that talks about the talent of the program. There's not a whole lot of talent. We, we, now we know the scope of the lack of talent. But I think there's a sign in the team meeting room that speaks, uh, says it all. No drugs, no, no weapons. And when, when I talk about the culture, and we're just still trying to sift through some of the Kyle Flood uh, era, it, they needed a cleansing, and by all accounts, he's really changed the culture in a positive way. We've written so many stories about the nutrition, and we talked about it on the podcast, strength and conditioning. Um, when when I say that he's changed the culture from all accounts, whether it's academics or just you know players in a community, um, you know he's rewarding players, not just disciplining players for for when when they act up, but rewarding the players who are doing the positive things with the Champions Club. I think he's really changed the culture. I'm giving him an A. I mean, I know it sounds uh, ridiculous because we're talking about a, a, you know, a season that, you know, a, a, a losing season, but, you know, he's a first year coach. I think the talent in the program, is, you know, it, it has been an issue. And I think we, you cannot lose sight of the fact that he was brought in for one job, for a, ma- a major part of the reason why he was brought in by the, this administration was to change the culture, and he's done that so far. My biggest question is how I didn't have you in college as a professor. You just gave him an A? <laughs> I did. I gave him an That's, A. I'm giving him an A uh, because he's a first-year coach. scored 224 to nothing against the, the four biggest programs I'm not, in I'm the, not minimizing the division. That. I'm not minimizing that. Fans pay a lot of money to, to see. Four Bob shutouts Murray. for the first time since I'm 1937. Not, and I'm not minimizing that. Fans okay. pay a lot of money to, to see, but they, fans also don't want to see player, uh, players get, get arrested. Seven players get arrested. Um, you know, the, the, some of the stuff, that, the drug stuff that we were talking about, you know, sexual assault. I mean, I'm talking about some really deep rooted right. stuff that was going on in this program that is, is way, way above beyond wins and losses. I think he is in a positive way, changed the culture. I think you guys are talking about two different things and that's kind of, yes, he probably does deserve an A off the field for what he's done in terms of changing everything. On the field, game days, that's, I think, where the C comes in from Steve. And that's what we used to say about Greg Schiano all the time, right? Is He was great recruiting. He was a great program manager. He was a great CEO. And then where did Greg Schiano fall, fall short? Those three hours on Saturday. Those three hours on Saturday. So uh, I don't know. It's too early to see what Chris will, will be like when he has his players on Saturday. Greg had 11 years of that resume. But uh, I think 
the A is probably deserved off the field. The C is probably deserved on we're, the field. Again, we're talking about first-year coach, and we were evaluating Greg Schiano in 2001. You know, everyone was just thrown out that, you know, looking back on what uh, Greg Schiano did it his first year. We're talking about a first-year coach who inherited – a total mess. There's a sign. I can't re- emphasize this enough. There's a sign in the team re- meeting room that says "No weapons, no drugs." Right. And I get, I and get treat that. women well. Treat, uh, treat yeah. women right. I, I, that. I think you're it right about g- giving them the A off the off the field. But if you're gonna, you, I'm not factoring that. I'm factoring that into the C overall grade. And they make no mistake. The on the field product is unacceptable. I, I and I know the talent is not there, but you can't, you cannot lose games like that on a regular basis. Uh, and it just, I have seen no signs on the field of what might happen. It takes a leap of faith now based on what this team is doing on the field to see it uh, get to a higher level. That, that's my problem with what happened this season. And I'll come in along the lines of Steve. I'll give them a C minus. I think they did pretty much everything right except for the, the actual product on the field. You look at some of the different position groups and uh, guys are struggling to compete, which is uh, kind of curious. You look at them physically, uh, all the work Kenny Parker has done. These guys are bigger. Uh, they're stronger. They look great. Um, but when they go out there, it's, 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 it's sort of tough watching them. Uh, they have trouble competing. They'll keep those games kind of tight. They'll be competing. They'll be com- fighting, fighting, and then something just gets lost in that at some point for whatever reason. But everything else off the field, magnificent. They infused a lot of energy back into this program, a lot of positivity, got the fans going. Uh, the recruiting class has been Awesome up to this point, landing Micah Clark, who I have as the top player in my NJ.com top 50, plays both sides of the ball, explosive player, and also a kid guys will follow. You got a legacy like Bo Melton uh, that they got to commit early. Uh, He'll come here and do some great things on the field, in space, with the ball in his hands. Um, But let's not act like Rutgers doesn't have players that nobody else wanted. I mean, you got guys that came here with 30 offers, guys like Darius Hamilton, J.J. Denman, uh, Chris Muller. Now, these are obviously bigs. They are somewhat lacking in the skill the skill department but where you're talking 78 to nothing it's not like they don't have enough talent to be able to scheme something a little bit a little bit tastier than that so I think they'll go back to the drawing board uh, there's some hard decisions to be made I, I do believe that Ash is the man for the job I love his message I love the vision uh, they just need to uh, figure out how to really pull this thing all together and put forth a better product on the field so what is the biggest problem on the field right we talked about Chris Ash and off the field and, and- Keith said an A and, and what he's doing to lay a foundation with a new culture here, but on the field, right? What's the biggest issue? How does this happen? And, and Todrick was just saying they do have some talent. They do have some players on this team. I mean, you guys mentioned the score, 224 nothing in those big four games. They also were outgained. I mean, it wasn't just like by accident. Like they were outgained by almost 2,000 yards in those four games. Ryan, for you, when you watch this football team in 2016, What's the biggest issue they have to fix moving forward? There's a couple issues. One, they're just outspeeded, if that's a word, on every— It, it is on a podcast. It, 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 a word. Yeah. <laughs> they're just outspeeded all the time. Without Janarian Grant, Jay Harris is their fastest player. It's On the perimeter, every team's faster than them. On offense, they can't get separation. On defense, they get run past. That's, that's trouble. Um, at the line of scrimmage, they want to be a line of scrimmage football team. Well, they're last in the Big Ten in rushing defense. They've struggled to run the ball. So they get out physical. That's what they want to be, and they get out physical. And then depth-wise, I mean, I think they have, Todrick mentioned, some guys who had a lot of other offers. They have a lot of guys who are Big Ten quality starters. They have no Big Ten quality depth. And Keith mentioned it earlier, the two recruiting classes of floods who were just shredded by transfers and dismissals. They have no depth. So they go from Big Ten quality starters to guys who are probably not Big Ten players at all as soon as you're on special teams, as soon as you're in the third or fourth quarter and guys need breaks. So they just get annihilated when it's other teams, starters or even backups against their backups. Was this inevitable, Keith, like this year? Like, you know, Chris Ash or it could have been Steve Politi or it could have been anybody else. Were they in such a bad spot roster-wise that some of this was inevitable? Maybe no one realized 78 nothing was going to be inevitable in a game. But did you think this could have happened this year just because of the where, where they were as a program? No doubt. I can't, I can't emphasize enough. I mean, 40% of two recruiting classes. And those recruiting classes, and Todrick knows this as well, they were not exactly, you know, top 25 classes. These were in the mid to upper 50s nationally, you know, 10th or 11th in the Big Ten. So they weren't really great uh, recruiting classes to begin with. You lose 40% of those players. You're talking about depth. You're talking about uh, special teams. Todrick's right. I mean, you do have players like Chris Muller and, and, and uh, Darius Hamilton who have – you know, a lot of offers. Um, Ash has had one year with those guys, so you could talk about the de- lack of development a little bit maybe. But 
they don't have depth. I can't emphasize that enough. We're looking at it right now. They don't have depth. The one other thing that I think that, you know, gets lost, they don't have an identity. I guess that's one thing that Ash needs to instill going forward is an identity. You know, Greg Ciano, you know, had the swarm, you know, defense, you know, they, they just, you know, they need an identity, I think, going forward. I they think, were, I think what surprised me, and, and, and you look at this program, one thing they've had throughout good seasons or bad, they've had these just playmaking receivers. They've had Mohamed Sanu. They've had Leonte Carew. They've had Brandon Coleman. They've had these guys, these big, physical, strong receivers. They don't have any playmakers on this team in this program. And I think that's been one thing to me that's very jarring is just to see when you look at the problems this offense has had, and believe me, the offense has just been unwatchable. They can't. I mean, they, they set a record for punts and the Big Ten with one game to go. It tells you all you need to know. Uh, when you see how bad this offense has been, to me, I think that's the one thing that, that just sticks out to me. Aside from, obviously, they have had quarterback issues since 1869, but now you don't have the playmakers who can who can do something on the field that can that can be creative, that can get open, that can make something happen. And that, that to me, has got to be the biggest area to address. Todrick, for you, biggest issue when you look at the team and, and why they're so bad, what do they have to fix? If there was priority number one in the offseason on the field to get it better for next year, what do you think it would be? Well, I just think the game, you know, starts in the trenches, you know, with the big hogs up front. Unfortunately, they're losing uh, a lot of their best players up front, so then that's another uh, area of concern for the team. Then they're going to have to look to build this thing through recruiting. And I just think a lot of it had to deal with trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Uh, you know, really, really, really – looking to force that power spread onto more pro set type personnel. Um, looks like these guys struggled a bit uh, with that sort of adjusting to this new style of play physically. Um, like I said, they look better. I know they were looking to, to, to really compete this year and just talking to some of the guys uh, throughout the off season, they were really excited about coming out to compete for this new coaching staff. But uh, ultimately uh, they had trouble adjusting uh, to, the, to the nuances of the offense. Now, you go to year two, these guys get a little bit more comfortable with it, uh, with, with this coaching staff, and you'll, you'll see what they put forth. But I think a lot of this goes back to that uh, 2014 recruiting season where this, you know, the team had 14 decommitments. And we're talking about some top-level players, one of which just uh, came to Rutgers uh, recently when Penn State came to town and Saeed Blacknall. They lost 14 guys out that re- recruiting class. And, and, and that's when this is when it shows up, about two to three years down the line with that lack of depth in the recruiting area, and uh, it's showing up on the field. There's, there's, there, there's a somewhat lack of talent now. They're not 78 to nothing bad, you know. I mean, they're, they're, they're better than be. that. That's bad. <laughs> they're, not, they're not 224 to nothing bad. I believe that there's ways as a coaching staff that you can find a scheme to manufacture some points through the offense and keep your team in the game because they had a pretty solid uh, – I, I don't know if we want to call the defense solid, but they definitely competed and showed up to play. Uh, just the offense, uh, offense let them down, unfortunately. Yeah, when Todrick mentioned the square peg around hole, uh, I've heard that a couple times, and I agree with that. That's what they tried to do. But I think that, speaking of things that are inevitable, that was inevitable. They were never going to come in here and run a pro-style offense. They were never going to come in here and run last year's defense. So at some point, Chris Ash had to do this. To Some senior class was going to lose their senior year because – whether he delayed it a year, then he was just going to try to go six and six with this year's team, which he probably, that could have happened. I think Sarge actually picked them to win eight games. We shouldn't forget that. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I th- and I think that in a way they probably could have gone six and six if they had carried it over. But eventually then next year's senior class was going to get the raw deal of trying to figure out this offense. So he probably was smarter in an era where coaches only get three or four years before they're run out of town. He was probably better off to say, listen, sorry, guys, this is what's going to happen. And these seniors actually handled that pretty well. Yeah, to gut it at first and then try to rebuild it from yeah, there. At some point, they've had seven offensive coordinators in seven years. I mean, that's got to be a record. At some point, you know, the players are learning. It, it, it wasn't as much of a factor when they're all learning a pro style. The terminology is similar, but now it's different, totally different. So at some point, that is going to be a factor too. Seven offensive coordinators in seven years, that's a lot. Well, yeah, I think you guys let us right into the next topic that I think we, you know, we need to talk about and Rutgers needs to figure out if they're going to get better, which is the quarterback play. And my favorite part about watching you guys cover the games each week is inevitably during the Saturday afternoon, one of you will start writing about the quarterback, right? And then what's going on? Who's in? Why are they in? What's happening? What are they doing there? And how, how do they get better? Is it just... You know, continuity in a system, Ryan, do you think that's where they have to – or do they they have to find the right quarterback for this system because it's such a drastic difference from what they used to run? 
Yeah, I think they have to find the right quarterback. And they, like Steve said, they've been trying to find the right quarterback forever. And now they're trying to find a right quarterback who's the different quarterback, who's totally different than anything they've ever wanted ever before. So I think it's easy from a fan standpoint. It's always the next guy, right? Like 12 months ago, Tylen Oden was the future. Now Jonathan Lewis is the future, assuming he signs and comes to Rutgers. And you know what? 12 months from now, it's going to be whoever the quarterback is in the next class who's going to be the future. They have to pick one and settle with him. I think Gio was, was a nice stopgap. I would have liked to see him play earlier this year. I think we all kind of knew Chris Laviano handled it well, but wasn't the right guy for this offense. Um, I would have liked to see them try that earlier. I would have liked to see them t- try Tylen Oden earlier. Uh, I guess the answer going forward is Jonathan Lewis, but I've never even seen him play. So how can I say that? And that's one of the this is one of the problems I, when we were talking about grades for the coaching staff. You know, remember now that Giorgino was not he was not even in the mix for a quarterback midway through the season. He was playing scout team, uh, and they then they decided to throw him out there and give him a shot. I mean, that just kind of speaks to a level of dysfunction. I think that they didn't identify him or didn't see him at practice, and then suddenly he's in the game and now he's your starter. Uh, I, I don't know how they could have done it better as far as quarterbacks go. Clearly, you know the right quarterback's not on the roster, uh, but it's just amazing to me that they could have a team with eight quarterbacks and none of them are capable of, of, of leading the offense. I mean that that's that to me is, is obviously predates this current coaching staff. And I look at it going forward too. Uh, it, people say, "Oh well, maybe bringing a grad transfer or a you know Chuko," and those guys aren't coming, uh, growing on trees. I mean, we saw they brought in a grad transfer. Zach Allen couldn't win a job. I mean, I guess Jonathan Lewis is, is the guy that they're banking on. I think it's going to be an open competition going forward. But it, it's you know that is it's seventy percent of, of of maybe the offensive. Uh, woes are, are are tied to the quarterback. I think it's an issue that they need to address. I don't know if there is a, a grad transfer, you know, out there that maybe they can get. But again, I don't. I, I don't think that gets solved overnight either. I don't want to see them do the grad transfer thing. Personally, I, I w- if if you believe in Jonathan Lewis, put Jonathan Lewis out there. If you believe in Tylen Oden, put Tylen Oden out there and live through a, another three and nine season or whatever as a freshman, and let's see what he can be as a senior. Because look what happened with Tom Savage. I know it's a different coaching staff, a different era, but you gave up on Tom. Tom Savage, who was a four-star recruit, he ends up going to the NFL as a third or fourth round draft pick. Who knows what he would have been as a Rutgers senior, but you didn't want to wait in the short term to find out. I don't think they should make that same mistake. Pick a guy, Odin, Lewis, Geo, anybody, pick a guy and ride the guy. And I actually have seen Jonathan Lewis play, and, and, and to be honest with you, I think that he is perfect for what they're looking to do in the power spread. I mean, he's very Cam Newton-esque in the way he uses his big frame to pick up extra yardage, running the football, can also throw the football with touch. Has made some tremendous throws. I think that's maybe what Tylen Oden was maybe missing a little bit of, the ability to pass the football. We see the explosion in the run game. But you got two guys uh, that you can sort of start to lean on and really look to develop. Uh, but I really do believe in Lewis. And, and, and it'll be interesting to see if they give him the keys to the car automatically uh, coming in as a big-time freshman quarterback why doesn't he have more off offers then I think he shut down his recruitment a little bit early I remember watching him as a sophomore sling the football around back when they had Wimbush and just saying wow this kid can really throw the football we're not even talking about ability to run the first time I saw him was actually at the Rutgers uh, passing camp uh, his sophomore year man he has a, a huge arm can really spread the field uh, stretch the field get the ball down the field um, he's worked on his touch and accuracy which I think has come a long way since last season uh, that'll be a huge area for him to continue to develop in um, but physically he has all the tools the one thing that you obviously have to look out for when running the power spread with these big quarterbacks is injury uh, he got dinged up this this past season playing against a, a Lincoln team suffered a neck injury that was pretty scary uh, was able to return to the field next week showing some toughness um, but um, you certainly have to look out for that but I think with what they're looking to do uh, he's certainly the perfect chess piece What's the, the marriage between finding the right quarterback and the system? And what do you guys think about the system? We've seen the spread work all around college football. I mean, the spread is everywhere. It's wait, football wait, now. There's a system? I'm sorry. I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> what do you think about what they're trying to do with this system? I mean, is this uh, just a matter, Steve, you think of finding the right quarterback and then this thing starts no, really moving? Okay, so, absolutely not. So you think there's, there's, they have to fix yeah, some things I, with the offense and find the I, right quarterback? It, it's, very, it's very difficult to know on, on a week-to-week basis what they're trying to do offensively. I mean, honestly, and I, I've, I defended Drew Maringer, the offensive corner, in a column because I, I strongly believe what Sartre said. You just can't just keep on changing the coaches and expect this thing to work. Eventually, you have to, have, you have to invest in one, live through the growing pains, and, and try to build the system that way. Some continuity. Uh, continuity. Uh, that said... You you know, there's just no excuse for the for the absolute lack of competency this offense has shown during the year. It's, I, I think, arguably the worst offense in school history. I mean, you can't really, I mean, it's, it's hard to believe, but when you score 56 off, offensive points in 
you know, whatever, how many conference games, it's, it's very hard to imagine, uh, you know, that, that the, the players aren't that bad. And what, what bothered me about what happened this year was the inability to get a running game. I thought they would come in this year with several talents. Robert Martin, a very good running back from last year. You know, I thought he would, uh, there would be one thing they would do well. And instead, it's been another weakness. So uh, I have a lot of questions about what the system is. And I, I would like to see it before you pass total judgment. I would like to see it with some of these receivers they have coming in with Jonathan Lewis to get, to get a sense of what, you know, if it's going to work or not. But right now, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of confidence. I think the uh, there are two plays I, I kind of remember that are going to be looked back, back upon. The Ohio State game where, where, where they're driving early, and then they try a trick play. It blows up in their face. And then the Penn State game, they, they, they recover the, the opening kickoff, and they try a reverse. Both of those plays were boiled down to execution. I mean, we, we, we kind of harped on it. Could he have been more creative? Could Drew Marringer have been more creative? Yeah. But sometimes it does boil down to execution. And – that trick play at Ohio State, I, I, I can't fault them for, for, for attempting to, to try to change it. The, they weren't going to beat Ohio State, but at least you gained some momentum early. I can't fault them for that trick play. It, w- it blew up in their face. I can't fault them for that. Same thing with Penn State, the reverse. I can't fault them for, for when a play blows up you know, due to execution. I think we've seen the power spread work other places where they have a lot of talent. Ohio State, even Houston, I guess, has a lot of talent. They came to Rutgers and annihilated them three years ago. So even they have some talent. And that was, you know, Drew was part of that staff. My point is they can't, I do think the system will work when you have the talent, but it's not just Jonathan Lewis. Let's not kid ourselves. If Jonathan Lewis came on this team this year, one year older, they wouldn't be any better. I mean, they still don't have Janarian Grant, which was a season-ending. I mean, when you say season-ending injury, it wasn't just a season-ending <laughs> injury for Janarian Grant. It was a season-ending injury for Rutgers football. I mean, it was a killer injury. They don't have anybody like that. Supposedly, Bo Melton's like that. Supposedly, some of these other kids are like that. But they're going to be true freshmen thrown in the fire. Amir Mitchell. Supposedly, some of these kids can do these things that they want them to do. But this isn't just insert a quarterback and go. This is insert all new offensive personnel and go, and without three senior offensive linemen. Good luck. Kid, yeah, yeah. And, and I secretly thought that when when Janarian went down, that things would open up offensively hmm. for this Rutgers offense, being that they didn't have that one player to depend upon to pretty much uh, do the majority of the work. But unfortunately, it just exposed the fact that there were uh, the cupboard was 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 somewhat bare at the skill positions, and that's tough to say when you got a guy like Robert uh, Martin, you got Hicks, you got guys that are known to be playmakers in the past, but for whatever reason, they were unable to get uh, get the ball rolling offensively. And then you look at you know, some of the play calls with Laviano, uh, some of the curious calls where you have him running in situations where, uh, you know, this is a, this is this is a Tylen Odin type situation after he had already kind of gotten him going. There were certainly some questionable decisions uh, made throughout the year. You know, I like Drew. I like the energy that he uh, inserts. Um, you know, I think he does well recruiting, uh, especially because he's, he's close in age with some of the recruits. And there's certainly some positive things that he has done. Um, but, you know, there, there were certainly some 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 questionable uh, points throughout the season. Uh, when it comes to offensive play calling. If I'm just going to give you a 30-second turning point of the season, it's the four plays where Janarian Grant got hurt, and then you just mentioned curious play calling. The number one curious play calling is Janarian Grant gets hurt, and then they have the ball first and goal at the three-yard line. Two runs by Tylen Odin where he can't get in the end zone up the middle, then two runs by Chris Laviano. They don't end up scoring in a game that I think was 7 nothing Iowa at the time, and they lose the game 14-7. They get right. zero points. Grant goes down. They don't score from the goal line. The team's totally deflated. They lose the game, and that's probably the be- who knows. That, that's the Big Ten opener. If they go one and zero in the Big Ten, who knows what we're talking about right yeah, now? Yeah, could be different. We could be having a different conversation. We're having this conversation, and they have to change it moving forward. That's the whole point of this podcast. Whole point of I, I think this regime with Rutgers, Toderick. I'm going to get your perspective on this. I'm going to get all your perspectives because you know opinions, what we know, and, and what you hear out there, Toderick. We'll start with you on this one. You're a recruiting expert, and I think the big question I have is. How much will this season impact the future seasons, right? Because we're all talking about how they need more talent. They need to get a foundation in here. But when you have a bad year, it's, it's obviously not good for recruiting. How bad will it be? Do you think this will impact the kids that do not want to come here anymore? What, what do you think is ha- going to happen here based on a tough first year for Chris Ash, recruiting-wise? Well, so far, they, they've suffered uh, minimal commitments. You know, uh, obviously a couple at the running back position. They've got one. Uh, along the defensive line. Uh, but it seems like the group that they have right now is somewhat intact um, and, and are coming in with the notion of let's be the reason 
that we turn this thing around. They seem to be holding hands and sticking together somewhat. The guys that you kind of have to look out for are the out-of-state guys that aren't necessarily as connected um, to the in-state guys. A guy I wonder about, like Tyshawn Fogg, um, although I hear he's still in the fold. I was supposed to speak with him last weekend. Um but but didn't hear back from him. Uh, so that's certainly interesting and will be something to watch uh, down the line. But I think uh, one of the most important cogs being Michael Clark, the top player in the state, is thoroughly committed, will be enrolling mid-year. So he'll be here in January, able to get some early work. He's a guy that can play multiple positions. I think ultimately he's special at offensive tackle. Um, but you watch him on the defensive side of the ball. He can play the five technique. He can play the three technique um, and really get you going in multiple facets of the game, uh, even at the tight end or, or DM position. So uh, I think he's versatile. I think he's a leader, a guy that some kids will follow. He's coming in with his brother, Jamal Beatty, another lineman. Again, they need to be better. Uh, up front obviously those guys are young so you, you, you can't really say how much you you can expect to get from them year one but at least it's a good sign to have some of your leaders sign on early get here get that wrapped up um, and, and send some goodwill throughout the rest of this recruiting class are they getting an and here's the question i have you know i don't, obviously can't follow this as closely as you do no one can follow this as closely as you do we don't we'd all lose our minds uh but <laughs> when you look at what they're i look at your charts in the, the coming class mm-hmm. i'm going to give them this one this is a very good recruiting class mm-hmm. uh are they get are they getting in with the guys this is what concerns me i see your list of the top juniors and the top sophomores and i see a lot of the usual ohio states florida right. Alabama. are they are they getting in with those guys because they don't get in with those guys well, we're back in the, we're gonna be back in the same spot in a couple of years yeah yeah i mean they're certainly doing a nice job uh competing and i thought they did a nice job really selling the process and not really selling uh selling kids on results from this season i feel like the expectations were somewhat tempered now you, you want to at least be able to show that you're going to go out there and compete uh, give them some type of reason to believe, to have something to hold on to. And when I talked to the committed guys like Jonathan Lewis earlier this year, one thing he grasped upon um, that made him hopeful was when uh, they inserted Geo and started moving the ball a little bit. So that gave him uh, some confidence uh, in his decision to stick with the hometown team. Uh, did they do enough of that this year to, to really satisfy uh, that itch for all the recruits, committed and non-committed? I mean, that remains to be seen. We got three months until signing day, but so far, uh, so good for the most part. Like I said, uh, only only a couple decommitments up to this point, and the guys they have remaining seem to be talking the talk at, at least. The thing I would say, and Todrick just said something that I thought was really that I thought was really interesting is they want to be the guys to turn it around, and I I've, I've certainly heard that at least twice in my life. When Greg Schiano first started and I was a student covering the team for the student paper, I heard that, and that worked out. Brian Leonard to this day, ten years later. Had, it takes the most pride of anything in his life that he committed to Rutgers when they were terrible, and he was on that field for 2006 when they beat Louisville. And it's not just Leonard. It's all, it's all those guys. It's Ryan Hard. It's Sean Tucker. It's all those guys. That is the best thing they've accomplished in their life. They love it. They took Rutgers from zero to the top. Leontay Carew, Darius Hamilton, Julian Pinnock, Zodrick, four or five years ago, where Kyle Flood's first signing day when Greg Schiano left right beforehand, they wanted to be the guys to take it to the top. Well, this is where they're leaving it. And they've had to adjust, do a 180 on the fly to, well, we're building a foundation and we want to be the legacy guys for Chris Ash. And that's nice, but that's not what they signed up to do. 18-year-old Deontay Carew, Darius Hamilton, wanted to win national titles. They thought they were going to the Big East. But And then they wanted to win Big Ten championships. That's not where they're leaving. They've had to adjust their goals on the fly. But that's not what they were signing up to do. I'm sure these kids think they can be the next ones. Which ones are they? Are they Brian Leonard or are they leaving five years from now like this? What I'm going to be looking at more more than anything, and and to Steve's point, it's not just the the top echelon guys. It's going to be the guys ranked from 10 to 20 in Todgers rankings because that's really how Greg Ciano built his program. He built it on (laughs) the Kevin Malice guys, uh, Ryan D'Imperio, Pete Tiburdoff. Yeah, the list goes on and on. These guys were, weren't the, the, the cream of the crop in the state. They were guys ranked from 10 to 20. And Greg would get, of those 10 guys, he would probably get seven or eight of them. And that's how you build a program. And I'm, that's what I'm going to be looking at more than anything. And also the recruiting map has, has changed somewhat. People talk about the state of Rutgers, and that's those states, uh, you know, which encompass the, the success that Rutgers has had, um, you know, leading up to the past couple seasons. And it's kind of changed. Um, I think Shiano built this thing on, on Florida. Um, New Jersey and New York, you know, those were the main states. And now you got a Midwest staff that's really placing a, 
uh, uh, emphasis on the Midwest and getting out there and landing some of those guys uh, where the talent is, the emphasis is less on speed and more in size and power to compete in the Big Ten. Um, but again, we talked about speed earlier. That's that's the one thing that they're lacking that they got from the, those Florida recruits. Now, it is tough to recruit Florida kids simply because uh, you can't get them here often enough to keep them to keep them interested to keep tabs on them. Those kids get a lot of offers just, offers just getting the benefit of the doubt because they play in Florida and they're known for having speed. So those get those kids get more offers than New Jersey kids, New York kids, and more opportunities. So when you can't quite keep your thumb on them, it's tough to keep them in the fold. And a lot of times those kids end up decommitting and making your program look bad. So I think why, that's why a lot of schools make the decisions to stay away from the state. But there's so many talented players there. I think speed is key, being able to run with some of these guys. You know, the size and power is good, but they need a nice combination of that to move forward in a positive manner. And I think just what Sarge said about uh, the Kevin Malice of the world, the McCordys were two stars. Um, Ash, Ash knows that. He's, he's made it very clear. He wants to be a developmental program. He doesn't expect to win every Micah Clark battle. He wants a lot of those three stars, so to speak, kids that he has to develop. He understands that. They, he, he, we'll see if he can do it, but he's made it very clear that he understands Rutgers has to be a developmental program where you take a kid, you redshirt the kid, and then as a redshirt junior, he's an impactful player. And one area that they really impressed me uh, when they first got to Rutgers is the way they competed uh, for recruits. I mean, these guys came in offering committed kids at other programs, uh, actively recruiting those kids, sending four or five coaches to the school uh, to re- to recruit, you know, recruit and show these guys some love. Uh, so they really came in uh, with a reckless abandon for recruits, showing that they'll do whatever it takes to make this program uh, move in a positive way. And I think that's a huge part of why they got off to a great start. Uh, it's just, you know, when it came down to the football at the end of the day, that's what dropped that grade down from an A to about a C, C minus, simply because the on field product uh, wasn't as good as uh, at least what we anticipated uh, as far as them just competing and hanging in some of these games. I don't think we expected them to go out there and win all of these games, but uh, I expected to see a little bit more from a competitive standpoint, those guys uh, hanging in some of these games, especially with the strength and condition Im- improvements uh, that we've seen from Kenny Parker, uh, for whatever reason that thing materialized. But it'll be inter- interesting to see what they can do moving forward. All right, when we started this podcast, guys, there was a lot of optimism. There was a lot of, all right, th- this is the new regime that's going to change it and fix Rutgers and put them on the path to being a consistent winner. Tough year on the field. Keith, you believe a good foundation has been put off the field. Should fans trust this process that obviously is off to a difficult start just on the surface, maybe beneath it's a little better? Should fans trust this process? Do we believe this is heading in the right direction despite early pitfalls? I think they, they should. And again, he's implemented a lot of things from the Ohio State model. We don't know. We don't know. You know we've written about Kenny Parker. We've written about nutrition, stuff that hasn't been done before. How how it translates, it's going to boil down to, 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 to getting players. I mean, we all know that. It's going to boil down to getting the, the players that fit the si- system. We we all know that. Um, should fans trust it? I, I, I gave him an A. I think that he's going to do enough positive things. And more than anything, if you look at you know the Michigan State, uh, the Ohio, uh, the, the Iowa model of keeping players in the program, developing them, and then by, like Ryan said, by your, their junior year, these guys are turn out to be players, guys that like were overlooked. Like Mark, Mark D'Antonio of Michigan State has built his program on, on developing players, keeping players in. They are one of the top programs in the country at keeping players, you know, and not losing them. So I think that's going to be the, the, the thing going forward. Can he develop players and keep them? I guess what concerns me, and, and you're right, we came into it with a lot of optimism optimis about the process. But when you when you see just how the four dominant programs in this division – just destroy them this year. It makes it hard to see. All right, what are we talking about? We're we talking about in the future. Are we looking at this team getting back to seven and five and getting to the Quick Lane Bowl and having that level of success again, where they can put a trophy in and feel good about themselves. You know, I think yeah, that that, that they can get there. What worries me now is that we have now we have four programs in Penn State, Michigan State, Michigan, and Ohio State that are just at an elite level. And and I, I just I, I'm just wondering how much how long it's going to take for them to get to the point where they're not beating these teams when they're competing with these teams and we're at the same level now. I mean, twenty two hundred twenty four to nothing. It, that, that that's what makes this season difficult. So, what's realistic in terms of that? Is it you know is it ever can they ever get to that level? Is it three years from now? Is it five? And what's 
what's really legitimate? I think the cool thing about football is it's a quick turnaround sport. Remember, just two years ago, I mean, Rutgers beats Michigan. Uh, just last year, Rutgers had a very good shot at beating Michigan State. Uh, they were in that game. They hung in there and were doing some really positive things. So it's a quick turnaround sport. Uh, you certainly have to be able to coach your guys up throughout the offseason, implement a plan that works for the personnel that you have, and I think you give yourself a shot. I think the message is right. I think the strength and conditioning program is right. As we've said multiple times throughout this podcast, pretty much everything except for the on-field results went right. Uh, so I think they're off to a good start. They can turn this thing around and fuse some excitement back in the program, but it's going to start with the X's and O's. Is that, is that the good? Is that good news or bad news <laughs> that they were that they were so close to, that they beat Michigan two years ago and that they almost beat Penn State because now they're so far behind them. I guess that's part of part of what I'm saying. And that and and there's four of them too. That's the other part of it. Now it's not that they are they got to catch in the old days. You got to catch Louisville when they were in the you know in the AAC, AAC well, and Big East. You know now they got four of these powerhouses. And I mean it's just that's a long it's a big steep hill. But can they be five? Can they be, you know, the fifth best team in the Big Ten? And was the fifth best team? I mean, Indiana, Maryland going into the final weekend, they were five and six, and that's getting to a bowl. I mean, can they, can they be five? Well, sure. Can they be six in the in the Big Ten uh, East Division? If that that gets you a, a ball game. That's a baby step. So I, I, you're right. I mean, it's going to be a long time before they, they they start competing with Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan. We all get that. But can they be Indiana and Maryland first? Yeah, I mean, I think the. Two different questions. How long until they're one of those teams? I, I can't even see it, honestly. How long until they can compete with those teams and beat those? Indiana beat Michigan State this year. Maryland beat Michigan State this year. Rutgers almost beat Penn State uh, two years ago. Before they can go 2-2 two and two with those teams and then maybe have an 8-4 and four season, that I don't think is that far off. I think they're close to that. They did that two years ago. The problem with that, and we say this all the time, the 2014 Rutgers season was everything broke their way. They won every close game. They won every game they should have won. They won two games. They were underdogs. Everything broke right in that season. And they went eight and five that they don't leave themselves a lot of room for error, especially now you're playing nine big 10 games instead of eight big 10 games, which they were two years ago. You have to win some of these games. You have to beat Iowa. You have to beat Illinois. You have to win your crossover games in the big 10 West because Rutgers wouldn't be in the big 10 if it wasn't in new near New York city. But that also puts you in the big 10 East, which is not where you want to be. So realistically, as we move forward with this, last one here. Do you think in-house, I mean, they probably always have these big dreams. A new, new coaching staff comes and they want to change Rutgers. But do you think realistically in-house, the, the next step is just to get to that level, the one you were mentioning, the fifth, sixth best team in the Big Ten, and, and the other stuff that's just not even, shouldn't be on the table right now? No, I think third is probably, you know, on a good year, you'd want to be the third. You don't want to settle for fifth, but I think third where you're two and two against those teams, whoever they may be. Michigan, you catch Harbaugh leaves, you catch Michigan on a down year. Urban Meyer's not going to be there forever. They were five and six the year before Urban, Urban Meyer got to it. Like, those teams can have bad years. Michigan State stinks this year. Um, you have to beat them on those years where they're bad. You don't settle for fifth. You hope for two and two against that. And of course, not the coaches or the players, but as a fan or realistically speaking, you hope to go two and two against those teams and have a nine and three season. And then, hey, you're playing in the Outback Bowl on New Year's Day. Forget 2006. That's your high for the Rutgers program. And if you look at 2018, I think the schedule, Ryan, I mean, you could probably talk, uh, say it off the top of your head. 2018, the schedule, the first six games are winnable. So I'm not trying to discount even you know ne uh, next season, but – Again, I think it boils down to uh, Graciano's program went to bowl games 10 of 11 years. I think that's something that a lot of Rutgers fans would take in a heartbeat you know, with, with Chris Ash. Get to a bowl game. Get, you know, get you know, six wins, seven wins, or whatever. That's a baby step. And I think you know, at some point the schedule will soften a little bit. I think the problem is, and you mentioned it when you talk about next year. I mean, I, don't, I think we can discount next year. Uh, this is the team that, you know, they're going to lose all the, the key players on both lines. They're going to start, perhaps start a true freshman quarterback. They're going to bring in all these new skill positions. Uh, they had a difficult season this year. I don't see how you go, you take the next step. Right, so then you're looking at 2018. All right. Uh, it's, there's still so many questions to get back to that point when you're going to bowl games every year. You remember, this, that, that's not that too far in the distant memory. Uh, just to get back to the level when you're going to bowl games and you're still facing that big climb to take that next step, which is what I think, you know, why are we doing this if we're not at least thinking that we're going to get there and we're going to play Michigan and we're going to start winning some of these games and we're going to get to this this point. That, that to me, is the, the big, the hard part. If you look at the, the history of the Big Ten, though, I mean, two teams have dominated the Big Ten for, for, for 120 right. years. It's been Ohio State, Michigan, and then Penn State every once in a while. You saw Northwestern, Iowa, but really it's two teams, okay? So championship and 
going to bowl games every year. The good thing about the Big Ten, too, the bowl games are pretty pretty, pretty good. So th- th- we're talking about two different things. We're talking about, you know, a, a, a conference that traditionally has had, you know, two teams win it. And we're talking, you know, 70% in 100 years, Ohio State, Michigan. That's not going to change. So two different things, bowl games and championship. I don't know if in, in, my, in our lifetime, I'm still young enough. I don't know if I'll ever see a championship. But I do think that this team will become a perennial bowl team again. And, and obviously, I'm the recruiting guy, but I think it all comes down to players. I mean, you look at the top teams in this conference, <laughs> most of their star players are from New Jersey. You look at Michigan, they're getting it done with Jabril Peppers, a Heisman candidate, Rashawn Gary play, playing a major role, uh, contributing along that defensive line, one of the leaders in the Big Ten in tackles for a loss. You look at Ohio State, Curtis Samuels uh, from New York, Noah Brown going up catching balls behind uh, defenders' backs, I mean, making plays. These guys are from New Jersey, which is probably one of the strongest recruiting states throughout the country when you talk per capita. So if you can really make it a a realization and keep these kids home, make that a reality. Give yourself a legitimate chance to win this entire thing. Obviously, it's a tall task. It's something that has yet to be done. We've been talking about it uh, for 20 years. (laughs) But if they could ever find a way to truly keep eight of the top 20, 10 of the top 20 kids home on a year-by-year basis, you give yourself a legitimate chance to win this whole thing. To summarize that, I think 2018 is the year Rutgers fans should circle on their calendar because of the schedule. Ohio State's the second game of the season, but the other first eight games are all the non-conference games and all the Northwestern, Purdue, Indiana, Maryland, and then you finish with the Monsters at the end. That's the game they should circle, I think, for in terms of when can we see some progress, when can we break through, when can we go back to bowl games. And then, like Todrick said, it's going to take eight eight of the top 20 kids, or the Peppers, the Barclays, the Samuels, if they all come here, that's when, like Sarge said, you could be the team that steals one from Ohio State or Michigan. The Illinois in 2005 or the Iowa last year or the team that when those teams don't win it once every you know once every eight years somebody else wins it you could be that team if you have the players eight episodes in rebuilding Rutgers from the Astros it feels like there's more questions than answers but there's also some hope there as you guys illustrated really appreciate everyone all of you being here and being part of this podcast and all of our listeners for going on this journey with us thank you for listening